Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, welcome to Week 12 on General Norms, Canon Law 1. Let us begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's begin our discussion here today with Canon 145 on ecclesiastical office. An ecclesiastical office is any function constituted in a stable manner by divine or ecclesiastical law to be exercised for a spiritual purpose. Now, prior to the promulgation of the 1983 Code, an ecclesiastical office could only be occupied by a cleric. That is not true in the new Code. A lay person can, indeed, uh, occupy an an ecclesiastical uh, office, and certainly does occupy ecclesiastical offices. So, for example, a lay person can function as a judge, promoter uh, of justice, defender of the bond, chancellor. Issues, things such as this, can all be governed by, uh, are all ecclesiastical offices, and they're governed by the prescriptions on ecclesiastical office. So, it's, it's a broad term, ecclesiastical office, and it's not, again, simply relegated to clerics. So, let's look at Canon 228, for example. Canon 228, paragraph 1, qualified laypersons are capable of assuming from their sacred pastors those ecclesiastical offices and functions which they are able to exercise in accord with the prescriptions of law. So, obviously, here, Code again understands that lay people and provides that lay people can certainly occupy ecclesiastical offices, again, with some modification. So, for example, if you look at Canon 274, 274 paragraph 1, only clerics can obtain those offices for whose exercise there is required the power of orders or the power of ecclesiastical governance. So, when we're talking about ecclesiastical governance and we're, when we're talking about the active role of ecclesiastical governance, that would be reserved only for clergy. Now, does the Office of Promoter of Justice and Defender of the Bond, is that an active uh, role in e- or, or an active exercise, rather, in ecclesiastical governance? Well, I would argue no. From this perspective, number one, the law provides that a lay person may occupy these offices. So, because the law provides such, the law would, would be contrary to the canon that I just we just looked at, two seventy four. So, I would say no, from that perspective. And also, the promoter of justice and the defender of the bond, their roles are really contingent upon the exercise of authority of a judge and or an ecclesiastical, uh, or a collegiate rather, tribunal. So their role is not independently active with regard to the exercise of the power of governance. It would be more in tandem, more in cooperation with other ecclesiastical uh, organs such as a collegiate tribunal. All right. All right, let's look at paragraph 2 of Canon 145. The obligations and rights proper to individual ecclesiastical offices are defined either in the law by which the office is constituted or in the decree of a competent authority by which it is at the same time constituted and conferred. All right, that's rather self-explanatory. Let's look at the provision of ecclesiastical offices, Canon 146. An ecclesiastical office cannot be validly acquired without canonical provision. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that it has to be legitimately conferred. All right? There has to be a canonical provision. Someone can't simply pop up, a priest can't pop up and say, all right, I'm the pastor of this parish. Or I'm a bishop can't say, all right, I'm going to be the bishop of this diocese. I've always wanted this diocese, so I'm, I want to be the bishop, so I'm going to be the bishop of this diocese. No, there has to be a canonical provision. 
the church has to confer this office. And again, that's the definition of an ecclesiastical office. All right, it constitutes in a stable manner by divine or ecclesiastical law, and the provision must be through the church. All right, Canon 147 here. Provision of an ecclesiastical office occurs by the free conferral of a competent ecclesiastical authority or by insulation by the same authority if presentation preceded it or by confirmation or admission granted by the same authority if election or postulation preceded it or finally by simple election and acceptance by the one elected if the election does not require confirmation. All right. Canon 147 is basically delineating the various means by which an ecclesiastical office is obtained. All right, uh, and we're going to go through these means uh, in the in the subsequent canon. So, but there are a variety of ways by which one can acquire an ecclesiastical office, and we're going to see those uh, as we study the uh, the following canons. Let's look at Canon 148. That authority which is competent to establish, modify, and suppress offices is also competent to make provision for them unless the law establishes otherwise. All right. So, again, this is uh, at play the principle of subsidiarity, that an individual who has the authority to establish, modify, or suppress is also competent to make provision. So, in other words, if someone is going to exercise authority and have a specific office in the church, they should be given all of the requisite powers necessary, indeed, to fulfill that and to be able to exercise that office. Canon 149. In order to be promoted to an ecclesiastical office, a person must be in communion with the church, in the communion of the church, as well as suitable, namely, endowed with those qualities which are required for the office in question, by universal or particular law, or by the law of the foundation. So the law of the foundation, again, we won't get into all this, but a foundation, a pious foundation in canon law would be akin to a trust in civil law. It's a place for holding assets. So a pious foundation may basically be running, operating uh, a parish or a shrine or something such as that. And so there may be specific, because it has juridic personality, there may be specific statutes relative to the foundation that delineates, all right, what are the requisite qualifications for, let's say, a pastor? What, what, are, what is necessary here? Something such as that. Okay, what's very important is that in, for an ecclesiastical office, you, you have to be a Catholic. You have to be a practicing Catholic in good standing with the church, in communion with the church, and you have to have those uh, qualities that are required for the office. All right, so for example, promoter of justice, uh, you have to be a canon lawyer. Right? You have to have a canon law degree. Uh, to be the defender of the bond, you have to have a canon law degree. You, you can't be an unbaptized person, have a canon law degree, and apply for a job to be the defender of the bond in the diocesan tribunal. No, you have to be a baptized Roman Catholic. All right? And then there are requirements for the office in question by universal or particular law. Let's say, for example, the uh, finance officer in a diocese. All right? A finance officer in a diocese certainly should be expert in, surprise, surprise, finances. All right? Maybe he should be a CPA or have a civil law degree with a concentration with regard to economic matters, maybe uh, tax issues, whatnot, with regard to the law. Not that that would uh, impact the church all that much, but you want someone with some type of financial background, but also someone who is a baptized Roman Catholic, all right, and is leads a life in harmony, which is congruent with the church, all right. And now I'm going to go out here on a limb, one of the one of the big problems as I see it, and again I'm probably in the minority, but these Catholic you want to call some of these places Catholic, these Catholic universities, I'm not talking about Catholic university, I'm talking about Catholic universities uh and our colleges that do indeed bear the name the the uh, title Catholic and at least in their mission statement they identify themselves to be Catholic and that they are indeed constituted canonically as a public juridic person in the church who governs these these juridic persons. 
it's a board of trustees. And as far as I'm concerned, it seems to me that a membership, a, 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 a trustee of one of these board, uh, one of these colleges, a, a member of one of these boards of trustees, that that person who actively governs a public juridic person in the church, I would argue that's an ecclesiastical office. And as such, persons who are members of these boards of trustees must be Roman Catholics in communion with the church, obedient to their bishops, obedient to the magisterium, all right, and that their vision for the university must be that vision which is in harmony with the mission of the church to educate and to spread the gospel and to spread the teachings of the church. That's not happening in many regards, and, and oftentimes you have individuals on these boards who aren't Christians, not, let alone not Catholic, they're not Christians. They have no understanding of the mission of the church, and that is not the, the vision in which they have in mind. Oftentimes these individuals are on the boards because they're very, very wealthy individuals, and I'm all for taking people's money for the church. I'm not against that. However, to put someone on a board of trustees who has no notion of what the Catholic Church is about or what her mission is, has no communion with the church, I think is absolutely illegal, personally. And I argue that membership on a board of trustees is indeed an ecclesiastical office, at least to me. Again, if you reread Canon 145, paragraph 1 and 2, it just seems to me that a, a board of trustees of a Catholic university or a Catholic college, that they are charged with governing that public juridic person in the church, and therefore that, that would constitute an ecclesiastical office, and therefore they have to be in harmony with the prescriptions of Canon 149. Let's look at paragraph 2 here of 149. Provision of ecclesiastical office made in favor of a person who lacks the required qualities is invalid only if the qualities are expressly required for the validity of the provision by universal or particular law or by the law of the foundation. Again, very important to emphasize, expressly does not mean explicitly. Expressly can mean implicitly. Otherwise, the provision is valid, but it can be rescinded by the decree of the competent authority or by the sentence of an administrative tribunal. So, in other words, it can be subsequently validated, if you will. Paragraph 3, this is unfortunate. Seminiacal provision of an office is invalid by the law itself. They're taking all the fun out of it. A seminiacal provision of an office is you're buying and selling ecclesiastical offices. Don't tell the Medici's about this, will you? Uh, it gets them all upset, or the Borgias. Ha, ha, ha. Obviously, we can't buy or sell ecclesiastical offices. Uh, it might be nice to get us out of some financial bind, but there you have it. It's invalid by the law itself. Let's look at Canon 150. An office entailing the full care of souls for whose fulfillment the exercise of the priestly order is required cannot be validly conferred upon someone who has not yet received priestly ordination. Okay, this is somewhat of a no-brainer. You can't uh, appoint a deacon as the pastor of a parish. You can't appoint a lay man or a lay woman as the uh, quote-unquote pastor of the parish. Why? Because pastor is an ecclesiastical office that entails the full care of souls. All right? So it, it, it requires the order of the priesthood. The same would be true. One cannot appoint a deacon to be an Episcopal vicar or a vicar general. Why? Because the term vicar in the law, vicarius, entails the full exercise of priestly powers, and therefore no one can assume any office that, in, uh, that possesses the title of vicar without being in the order of the priesthood. All right. So this bit for as you know, Sister Mary Holy Water is the vicar for religious. That is absolutely invalid and absolutely illegal. That Deacon Buck Jones is the Episcopal vicar for the diaconate is absolutely invalid, absolutely illegal, because the term, the title vicar must entail 
the exercise of priestly uh, authority, and therefore one has to be in the order of the priesthood to validly exercise that office. So vicar general, episcopal vicar, what have you, parochial vicar, these ecclesiastical offices must all be occupied by priests, all right, and priests alone. Let's look at 151. The provision of an office entailing the care of souls is not to be deferred without serious cause. Okay, this is obvious in the law. Uh, for example, with regard to a vacant diocese. All right. If you if you look at the canons with regard to the vacant see, basically the timeline of the law is that a diocese should not be vacant longer than a year. And obviously, when a diocese is vacant, that particular church is looked upon as being orphaned as being uh, in some way not uh, as being susceptible, if you will, to dangers. And so it needs a pastor. All right, it's, it's like a, uh, they're like sheep without a shepherd, to, to borrow from the scriptures. So the, the filling of, of dioceses, the, even, even the filling of, of parishes, should be done expeditiously, quickly, swiftly, so that danger to the flock is minimized. So, uh, these things are not to be deferred for a long period of time. There, there should be uh, the provision of offices to be rather swift. Okay, let's look at Canon 152 here, shall we? Two or more incompatible offices, that is, offices which cannot be fulfilled at the same time by the same person, may not be conferred upon one person. Okay, what does that mean? Well, sometimes there's a natural oh, conflict of interest, shall we say. All right. So, for example, a judge in the ecclesiastical tribunal shouldn't also uh, function as the defender of the bond. There's an innate contradiction there. Or, for example, we have the office of vicar general in the diocese, and the office of vicar general in the diocese is someone who possesses, by office, ordinary executive authority for the external forum throughout the entire diocese. All right. We also have, if you will, a vicar general, quote unquote, for the internal forum, all right, and that is known as the diocesan or the archdiocesan penitentiary. This would be the a priest who is the delegate, if you will, the representative, the vicar uh, for the diocesan bishop for the internal forum, all right, for matters dealing with the internal forum, for dispensations dealing with the internal forum, etc. So. It would be a contradiction to have the vicar general, who deals with matters of the external forum, uh, be that same person who's the uh, archdiocesan or the diocesan penitentiary who's dealing with the internal forum. They need to be separate individuals. All right. So, for example, in the archdiocese of St. Louis, I am the archdiocesan penitentiary. So I basically function as the vicar general, if you will, for the internal forum. It would be incongruous for me to also exercise this jurisdiction in the external forum. All right, so there would be a conflict there of interest, as we say in the, in the uh, secular realm. Okay, let's look at Canon 153 here. The provision of an office, which is by law not vacant, is by that very fact invalid, and a subsequent vacancy does not validate the provision. So, okay, so a pastor is appointed by an, uh, an administrator who doesn't have any authority to, to, to uh, appoint a pastor, and there's already a pastor there in the parish. He's not been uh, canonically uh, transferred, what have you. Uh, all right, the, the action's invalid. Let's look at paragraph two. And, and it doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, in paragraph one, it doesn't validate once the uh, office is, does become vacant. But if it is a question of an office which by law is conferred for a determined period of time, the provision can be made within six months before the expiration of this time, and it takes effect on the day of the vacancy of the office. All right, so there are a number of offices that have five-year provisions. For example, the Office of Vicar General, the Office of Judicial Vicar. These are five-year terms, all right, and at the end of five years, let's say four and a half years out, the Dyson Bishop can say, all right, I'm going to appoint... Monsignor Smith to be the new judicial vicar, and Monsignor Jones's term as the judicial vicar ends in six months. So, 
That's for the smooth uh, transferring power, and that's that's fine. Three, a promise of an office, no matter uh, by whom it is made, has no juridic effect. Wow. This reminds me very interesting in the history of the church. The Archbishop of Cincinnati in the 1930s, his name was Archbishop McNicholas, and he was a Dominican. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant philosopher. Brilliant philosopher. And very, very, very close friends, closely associated with Pius XI, a real confidant of Pius XI. Well, in 1938, Cardinal Hayes, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of New York, died. And Pius XI had all the documents, all the decrees uh, written to appoint Archbishop Nicholas to the See of New York. So he was destined to be the Archbishop uh, of New York. All right, and I would dare say that Pius XI informed Archbishop Nicholas uh, of that fact. Well, lo and behold, Pius XI dies, and Pius XII, in 1939, is elected uh, Roman Pontiff. Well, Pius XII wasn't all that friendly toward Archbishop Nicholas, all right? Therefore, that promise of office, no matter by whom it is made, even if it's the Roman Pontiff, Pius XII, abrogated the decrees of Pius XI. Again, these decrees were not publicized yet. And he appointed, in 1939, the Auxiliary Bishop of Boston, Francis Joseph Spellman, to be the new Metropolitan Archbishop of New York. There you have it. Let's look at Canon 154 here, shall we? An office which is vacant by law, but perhaps held by someone illegitimately, can be conferred provided that it is duly declared that the possession is illegitimate, and provided that this declaration is mentioned in the document of conferral. All right? So there, sometimes there are people who are, uh, occupy offices uh, illegitimately in the church. All right? Maybe they don't have the requisite qualifications or what have you. Let's look at Canon 155. A person who confers an office while supplying for someone who is negligent or impeded, thereby acquires no power over the person upon whom the office was conferred. And the juridic situation of that person is determined just as though the provision has been made according to the ordinary norm, just as though the provision has been made according to the ordinary norm of law. All right, so again, this is the, the, the law, I, I believe, uh, 154 and 155. These are providing for practical, real human situations of sometimes, this is humanity here, huh? And the law recognizes sometimes people fail, people have shortcomings, and here the law is providing for this for the good of the church, for the good of people. So when you supply for someone who's negligent or impeded, we're saying that it requires no power over the person upon whom the office was conferred. And let's look at Canon 156. The provision of any office whatsoever is to be made in writing. All right. Again, there's a legal maxim, quote, nonis in actis, nonis in mundo. If it's not in the acts, it doesn't exist. So in other words, if something's not written down, it doesn't exist. Okay. All right. Let's look at Canon 157 here, shall we? Pre-conferral. Now, these following canons are going to be the specific uh, dealing with the specific ways in which an ecclesiastical office is uh, provided. And again, this goes back to Canon 147, remember. These are going to be the particular, the, the tangible ways in which an ecclesiastical office is to be uh, conferred. Okay, let's look at Canon 157. Unless otherwise explicitly determined by the law, it is within the competence of the diocesan bishop to provide for ecclesiastical offices in his own particular church by free conferral. All right, this is a very generic canon, and it's basically saying, all right, the diocesan bishop can appoint, and that's what we're talking about. He appoints these different people for these different offices. All right, so pastor, judicial vicar, vicar general, promoter of justice, defender of the bond, a dean's. All of these various offices are that's free conferral. He's appointing them. So that's Article 1. 
Let's look at Article 2 here with regard to presentation, Canon 158. Presentation for an ecclesiastical office must be made by the person who has the right of presentation to the authority whose right it is to install someone in the office in question. And furthermore, this presentation must be made within three months from the receipt of notice of the vacancy of the office, unless something else has been legitimately established. Okay, all right, what does this all mean? Well, the church, the Holy See, has entered into what we call concordats. I think we, we spoke about that earlier in the course, a concordat. A concordat is a treaty between the Holy See and some uh, civil entity, between the Holy See and some political uh, entity, some nation, some, some independent, autonomous political entity. Now, the terms of that uh, political agreement, this concordat, may be indeed that the civil authority in the country, maybe it's the prime minister, uh, maybe it's the king, all right, the monarch, they have the right, according to the terms of the concordat, to present candidates for Episcopal sees in their country. So they may have the right to present three or four candidates for a specific uh, see in their country. So this would be what we call the right of presentation. They're presenting these individuals for the ecclesiastical office. Now, what are the, 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 the canons must be uh, adhered to of the universe, of, of the code of canon law must be adhered to by the by the concordat, obviously. So the right of presentation is made, the presentation must be made within three months of the receipt of notice of the vacancy of the office, all right, unless something else has been legitimately established. Well, the terms of the concordat could possibly uh, establish other time frames. Uh, let's look at paragraph two. If the right of presentation belongs to a certain college or group of persons, the person to be presented is to be designated according to the description of canons 165 to 179. All right, this would be norms for election. All right, let's look at, at a different scenario. We may have what we call a general chapter in a religious community. And the general chapter or some type of assembly may present candidates to be the, what we call in canon law, the supreme moderator. In other words, the generalissimo or generalissima of the order. Again, that, that group or that college may make these presentations, okay, to, it could be to the uh, general council, depending on how a religious community is so structured. It could be to a diocesan bishop, or it could be to the congregation in Rome, for institutes of, of consecrated lives and societies of apostolic life. All right. Uh, again, it just depends what the particular statutes of the particular constitution of the particular religious order, how that reads. So what I'm saying is there could be this, this, this right of presentation for superiors and whatnot could be done in terms of the religious community as well. Okay, let's look at Canon 159. No one may be presented who is unwilling. Hence, a person proposed for a presentation who has been asked about his or her willingness can be presented unless the person has declined it within eight days of available time. Okay, and again, this is simply to ensure that these processes basically function expeditiously. So you don't want to go through this whole process of presenting someone and then they don't want the office anyway. Let's look at Canon 160 here, shall we? A person who enjoys the right of presentation can present one or even several candidates either at one time or successively. All right, and again, this would be provided for in particular law, either with regard to a concordat if we're dealing with a, with a country, or with regard to uh, what the specific statutes of a religious community or religious order stipulate relative to a group or a college of presenting candidates to function as uh, superior. Okay, paragraph two of Canon 160. No one can present himself or herself. A college or group of persons, however, can present one of its own members. Okay. This has been somewhat well-founded in the law that, for example, with regard to papal election, it used to be that the Roman pontiff, to be elected Roman pontiff, you had to have a two-thirds majority plus one. The plus one was to preclude the OK 
occasion of a cardinal voting for himself, and therefore his vote would have basically been the vote that would have been determining his election to the papacy. So this this bit about presenting oneself is not to be is not to be done. Let's look at Canon 161. Unless otherwise determined by law, a person who has presented someone found to be unsuitable can present someone else only once more and within a month. So the law, uh, again, is providing for, uh, as I said in, these, in these, some of these previous canons, all right, the human element, huh? But it's also, uh, the, the 161 highlights the fact that if you're going to present someone, they need to be vetted, you need to investigate, all right, who are these people, uh, are, uh, are they indeed suitable, and uh, that there, there should be an extensive uh, investigation with regard to their character and qualifications before you actually present them. All right, this is to ensure that we get quality. All right. If this happens, uh, you can present someone else only once more and has to be within a month. Paragraph 2 of 161. If the person presented declines or dies before the installation, the person having the right of presentation can again exercise such right within a month of the receipt of notice of the refusal or of death. Canon 162. A person who has not made a presentation within the available time, according to the norm of Canon 158, Paragraph 1 and 161, or who has twice presented someone who has been found unsuitable, loses the right of presentation for that instance. Okay, so first of all, when we talk about available time, we're talking about tempus udale, we're talking about useful time. So situations in which a person who would be capable of presenting, making a presentation, would have been in the hospital or legitimately called away, whatnot, and could not have exercised this office, well, that, well, that would not be what we would call available time or useful time. So even though it might be a month, that month period may not be a calendar month. It, it, it could be extensive. It, it could extend beyond an actual time frame of a month simply because the person was hospitalized for two weeks or the person was legitimately called away for two or three weeks and did not was not able to exercise their, their right with by the presentation so okay so the person by the by the law itself loses the right of presentation for that instance with regard to these issues in 162 and the authority whose right it is to install is competent to provide freely for the vacant office, with the consent, however, of the candidate's own ordinary. Okay, and again, this is the principle of subsidiarity, and again, it is to ensure the quality and competency of the individual. So obviously, we're talking about a diocesan bishop, the right to install these would be speaking about the Roman authorities, huh? Let's look uh, lastly at Canon 163. The authority which is competent, according to the law, to install someone who has been presented is to install the person who has been legitimately presented, whom he or she found suitable, and who accepted the office. But if several have been legitimately presented who are found to be suitable, the authority must install one of them. Okay, so again, this provides for the rights of the person or, or college who is making the presentation, as well as the discretionary powers of the one who has the authority to accept the presentation or choose from one of the individuals who has been presented. So it, it's, again, it's a reasonable exercise of rights, and it, it shows, I believe, a balance here where rights can function uh, in harmony with one another. Well, I think that's enough suffering for today, and let us conclude in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.